welcome everybody to this evening's lecture. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Mike Pitstick. I'm Associate Director of Annual Giving here at UD, and I'm happy to be with you. A little bit about Encore. Uh, this is a lecture series conducted by faculty of the University of Dallas in conjunction with the Office of Alumni Relations. The lectures are offered to alumni and friends and reframe topics from the core curriculum in fresh perspectives. This evening's lecture, Maimonides and Abraham, What is the Beginning of Wisdom, is co-hosted by Liberal Learning for Life's Studies in Catholic Faith and Culture program, which facilitates intellectual formation in the Catholic liberal arts tradition by offering video-based courses co-taught by UD professors. Videos like the ones we will watch together today are currently available for free. Uh, there's more information on that in the chat uh, if you would like it. Our video today is just one of the 20 sessions of the course, The Person, History, and Tradition. You'll first see Dr. Greg Roper, who will introduce Dr. Perrins' presentation, followed by Dr. Perrins speaking on wisdom in the Jewish tradition, and at the end, We'll briefly hear the Cistercian monk, Father Stephen Gregg, who teaches in the English and theology departments here at UD, present a poem by Dana Joya. I encourage you to use the chat box during the video to note anything you find interesting, inspiring, or worth discussing so that we can come back to it. There is a handout available as well, and you can find that link in the chat. While we're learning together and enjoying each other's company, feel free to grab a snack or pour a glass of wine. I have mine here. Um, and after the video, Dr. Michael West, Affiliate Assistant Professor of English and the Outreach Director in the Liberal Learning for Life program, as well as UD alumnus, will lead a discussion of the video. Uh, without further ado, I think we can get started with the video. Welcome back to Studies in Catholic Faith and Culture. Last time, we studied the Aeneid with Dr. Moran, and with Dr. Ron Romes, we began to explore the Catholic sense of history and tradition. Remember how he said it? The only God I know is the God my mama taught me. And right, that the Catholic person is an historical kind of a thing. So we began to explore that rich, possibilities that who we are as persons are deeply embedded in history and tradition. Today we begin to work into even more of the roots of that tradition, today specifically the Jewish roots of the Catholic sense of tradition and history. Today we have Dr. Joshua Perrins to introduce us to the Jewish tradition, especially with regard to wisdom. Dr. Perrins is Jewish and is the Dean of the Brand of Graduate School and wants to introduce you today to the thought of Moses Maimonides, the greatest philosopher of the Jewish tradition. Moses Maimonides lived about the same time as St. Francis and St. Dominic, at the time when medieval culture was expanding and exploding with the, the cathedrals, the birth of the universities, the expansion of the Crusades, the huge growth in medieval culture. So Moses Maimonides lived in North Africa, lived in Alexandria. He produced one of the greatest commentaries on the Torah that the, the whole Jewish tradition has. His specific question that Dr. Perrins wants to introduce you today is the question, what is the origin of wisdom? Where does wisdom come from? The Psalms say the source of wisdom is fear of the Lord, but the Greek philosophers said wonder is the source of wisdom. Dr. Perrins is going to explore how Maimonides tries to see if these two can be reconciled in some way. And Maimonides picks out the figure of Abraham as the one to help him ask this question. Maimonides takes up this question, what is wonder? What is fear of the Lord? And what is, what is the relation between these two things and these two visions of wisdom? There are two different views can be grasped by starting with that passage from Proverbs regarding the origin of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
In contrast, the view of Socrates, of Plato, and of Aristotle is that wisdom begins in wonder or perplexity. Strangely enough, Maimonides puts these two different ways of viewing the matter in one character, the character of Abraham. Now, of course, Abraham is the father of us all and the father of the three great monotheistic faiths. It's no wonder that we would turn to him, and it's no wonder that Maimonides would turn to him. Still, it's a little bit odd what he does with Abraham. He argues that Abraham is the proto-philosopher. He grew up in Ur of the Chaldees, which is to say, among pagans. But even as a small child, he began to wonder to himself about what the causes of all things were. And he began to speculate and sought what Maimonides refers to as speculative proofs. Maimonides turns to Abraham and that most poignant of all passages in Abraham's life, the binding of Isaac. I want to pause and remind you of an interesting difference between the Jewish and the Christian views of this moment. In the Christian tradition, in great works of religious art, this passage is referred to as the sacrifice of Isaac. In the Jewish tradition, it's referred to as the binding of Isaac. Why? Because in the Christian tradition, this passage is viewed as a foreshadowing of God's sacrifice of his son. In contrast, in the Jewish tradition, we resist the notion that this should be thought of as in any way a consummated act. And he put forth his hand and took the sword to sacrifice his son, and behold, an angel of the Lord from heaven called to him, saying, Abraham, Abraham. And he answered, Here I am. And he said to him, Lay not thy hand upon the boy, neither do thou anything to him. Now I know that thou fearest God, and hast not spared thy only begotten son for my sake. For Maimonides, the binding of Isaac is interpreted in the following way. Yes, Abraham fears God, but what is the origin of this fear of God? According to Maimonides, his fear is not a fear of any kind of physical punishment or the hope for any reward. Instead, one needs to think about the place of Isaac in Abraham's life in order to understand Maimonides' interpretation. Isaac, a child born to Abraham in his age, quite late in his life, when he had little or no hope of having a child. And this child was the promise were the manifestation of the promise that God made to Abraham that he would make of him a great people. Now, those of us who have had children know very well that though we love our spouses, there is a strange way in which the love of our children may well be the greatest love we have. After all, in loving our children, we all know very well that they are the first people for whom we would sacrifice our lives. So, according to Maimonides then, he has this great overwhelming love for his son. And yet God is asking of him that he should be willing to sacrifice him. So, in fearing the Lord, what is he fearing? He says, that is Maimonides says, Abraham does not fear any physical suffering. He hopes for no reward. What then does he fear? He fears the loss of God's love. There's only one thing in the world then that he values more, perhaps, than his own child and the love he has for that child, and that is God's love. According to Maimonides then, the binding of Isaac, the fear of the Lord and the love of the Lord is connected then with a God who is personal and cares for us. When, according to Maimonides, 
Abraham is described as filled with wonder and in a search for the causes through a study of the heavenly bodies. He is, in Maimonides' view, the proto-philosopher. He is seeking for causes, and when seeking for the source of all things, he is seeking a God who is characterized by Maimonides elsewhere as one who knows the species, but not necessarily the individuals. The question is, can the proto-philosopher be reconciled with the Abraham who fears and loves God? According to Maimonides, these cannot be reconciled. One way of thinking about it is that the fear and the love of the Lord, according to Maimonides, is a fear and love of a very personal God. In contrast, the wonder and perplexity that leads to philosophy is the search for the causes of the whole and a search for God as the cause of all things. Can these two be harmonized? If we are to trust Christianity, they can be reconciled in the Christ. Maimonides, however, suggests they cannot be reconciled. I leave it to you to explore these problems and to consider Athens and Jerusalem, whether they really are in conflict, whether their visions of wisdom are different or ultimately the same. For the Jewish tradition and the Christian tradition, Abraham came to wisdom in the sacrifice of Isaac. Now I want to do something we're going to do throughout the series, have a poem that might address that very question. It's a poem by the living, the contemporary Catholic poet, Dana Gioia. It's a poem called Simply Prayer, and he wrote it on the occasion of the death of his own son. And he begins to roll out his own names for God before turning at the end to his prayer to God for his son. To bring that to you is Father Stephen Gregg of the Cistercian Monastery. Father Stephen has one of the most beautiful and subtle literary minds I know. He teaches theology and mathematics at the Cistercian School and also teaches literature for us here at the University of Dallas. Listen to this poem and see how it takes you into the incredible suffering of this awful moment of the death of his son and how Dana Joya comes to wisdom through that. Prayer by Dana Joya. Echo of the clock tower, footstep in the alleyway, sweep of the wind sifting the leaves, jeweler of the spider web, connoisseur of autumn's opulence, blade of lightning harvesting the sky, keeper of the small gate, choreographer of entrances and exits, midnight whisper traveling the wires, seducer, healer, deity or thief, I will see you soon enough in the shadow of the rainfall, in the brief violet darkening a sunset. But until then, I pray, watch over him as a mountain guards its covert oar and the harsh falcon its flightless young. Why write a poem called Prayer? If you need to pray, Surely there are plenty of prayers. But we all know that true prayer demands an exercise of the mind and the will. It often sparks off of some experience of difficulty or joy. True prayer is a challenge. What if when you needed to pray each day, instead of returning to a familiar prayer, a wonderful thing to do, you decided to try to discover a new title for God, a new way from your own experience of expressing the name of God. That's what Dana Joya is doing in the poem, Prayer. He wrote the poem in honor of his firstborn son who died as an infant. 
surely a traumatic experience for a new father. In that kind of moment, the death of one's firstborn, the poem is not going to be just a decoration or an exercise of delight for the mind or some wordplay. The poem becomes a way of probing a wound, of sharing that experience of probing the wound, of offering it for healing to God, and of bringing it to the community as an experience to share. There is surely no very easy way to deal with the sorrow of death. We might look for a lot of different kinds of comforts. We certainly will turn to prayer, perhaps returning to a familiar place of prayer. But for a poet, for the person who is is called to that particular way of living and experiencing the world, inventing the new expressions is surely a valuable one. And Dana Joya comes up with some interesting Um, fascinating, sort of unusual ways of addressing God. They're kind of threatening. An echo of the clock tower, sort of for whom the bell tolls. There's this dangerous sign. Footstep in the alleyway sounds like the thief that he later mentions. The thief who comes in the middle of the night. The sweep of the wind in the autumn leaves. Then there's this odd grouping of them as well. He says... The jeweler of the spider web. Spider webs are awfully beautiful, but spiders are also beautiful, but a little terrifying. But a sense that there's a carefully crafted creature there that's still intimidating. Or he calls God a connoisseur of autumn's opulence. As if that changing of the color of the leaves as they approach the winter of death is a beautiful thing that God understands, and we may not. The harvest to us seems like the blade of lightning that is tearing things apart. So he is coming up with very difficult images and curious images to engage the mind and try to express what it must feel like when it seems like God has stolen one's firstborn child as an infant. When as he then turns later, at the end of the poem, the child he describes as, as ore still inside a mountain, as unmined potential or this flightless child, the way that the falcon, which is harsh, this frightening creature, still watches over its young. He is praying that God, whom he imagines with such power and beauty, but also terror and real awe, is someone that he is reaching towards to try to pray. Watch over the beautiful child you created because you are, and maybe my favorite description in the poem, the choreographer of entrances and exits. You have given, you have taken away. The child came from God. The child returns at the right time. It's a beautiful poem of turning from difficulty and darkness and the walking through the alleyway, the echoes and the sweep of wind to the sense of lodging the child back in the nest of God. Heartbreaking and, and beautiful, no? I hope after these two, the presentation by Dr. Perrins and the poem recited by Father Stephen, you have a great deal to mull over in your discussion. But here's a few things that I might lead you to before I turn you loose for that discussion. Where do you find wisdom? Have you found wisdom in your own life more in fear of the Lord or in wonder? Are those two things reconcilable? Are they the same? Are they a different way to come to wisdom? What are the different names you have for God? Dana Joya gives a whole series of different names. What are the names that you find most profound, that most articulate your relationship to God? Where does Dana Joya end up in his wisdom at the end of that poem? And where do you find your own relationship to God, and your own sense of wisdom. Where has your tradition, where has your history brought you to that wisdom? And how does it give you hope for going forward in your life? 